The story that was told was that a random girl just showed up to the Boston Marathon and out of nowhere came in second. There's a little more to the story than that though. Sarah Sellers. I live here in Tucson with my husband Blake and my border collies Indian Basin and a fish tank and two birds. I feel like my training at Weaver State, um, training through winter, some were a lot harder than others, uh, was key in preparing for Boston. Um, I'm very used to running in sleet, um, you know, having your hands totally numb when you finish a run, and that's not unique to not a lot of runners, but I think um, it did prepare me to just be mentally totally comfortable in the conditions of Boston. Like, I was never worried that I wouldn't finish. Going into Boston, I put in a solid training block. I set a goal that I wanted to run the Olympic Trials Qualifier, particularly I wanted to run the A standard of 237. The weather was just like brutal and it really wasn't until the night before the race that I finally mentally accepted that this is the conditions I had been dealt. It really became about um, just putting in the best race that I could in those conditions. So the gun goes off in Boston. Being only my second marathon, I knew the most important thing was to be very conservative very early. The headwind was really the biggest factor. The rain and cold really wasn't that big of an issue, but combined with the brutal headwind, like, it was very taxing. When I was in sixth grade, my parents moved our family to a house that was right on a trail system in Ogden, Utah. So at that point, my parents started running with some friends on the trails. She said, well, I want to come. And we first said, well, we don't want you to, not like we were going fast, but we don't want you to slow everybody else down. And so she came one morning, she didn't slow anybody down. And it wasn't any sort of training. Like I wasn't, you know, training for something specific. Um, but my parents had both run track and cross country in high school and, um, I was not really that good at any other sport. Probably close to the halfway mark, I was, I was hurting. Glanced over my shoulder and there was a pack of women who was um, gaining on me. But I made the decision then to slow down and let the pack catch me. I was gonna hang with this pack until I got fairly close to the finish. Um, so hung on to that pack and then uh, Rachel Highland, who ended up finishing fourth, uh, she came by and passed the pack and I, was feeling good at that point, so I went with her and basically ran with Rachel um, until probably, I think, mile 22. Um, and at that point, I felt good and I kind of had a second wind. Um, but when we got, you know, close to the finish, probably three miles to go, um, I think at that point I broke away from Rachel and it was just kind of a a blur of trying to hold on and not um, not give up my pace. I remember coming through the finish shoot, it was just like a screaming tunnel and like wind and rain and so many like, I don't know, you can't think straight and so many emotions. And I remember thinking like, oh, I must be doing really well because in the finish shoot, they seemed just like so excited. So I was like, oh, maybe I'm like finishing pretty high up and then Yuki Kawauchi, who was um, the men's winner, he passed me in the finish shoot. And I remember my heart sank a little bit and I thought like, oh, I'm not doing as good as I thought. Like, they're cheering for the men's winner. I crossed the finish line, reflexively stopped my watch, and then I turned to the volunteers lining the finish shoot. And I was like, what place am I? And I remember a couple of them kind of stepped back and like looked surprised that I was asking that. And <laughs> Then uh, a race official took me aside and she's like, honey, you were second place. 
I still didn't grasp the reality of that until um, I saw my husband about 30 seconds later. Um, he didn't know what place I finished. Hobbled up to Blake and I said, do you know what place I was? And he was like, no. I was like, I was second. And he started jumping up and down and yelling, you're second at the Boston freaking marathon. <laughs> and that initial feeling of a um, little bit of fear when I finished, like that was kind of a reality check because I worked my normal shifts and I was suddenly balancing like doing interviews in the middle of the night on every lunch break before and after work like trying to get back into running training for Boston last year I had pretty recently started my first job as a nurse anesthetist um, I was working four sometimes five days a week and you know at the hospital at 6 30 in the morning and then leaving between five and six most days and trying to balance a training block around that um, was a huge challenge and at the time i saw it as a hindrance to my training and i was doing the majority of my hard workouts after work by myself um, when i was pretty tired um, but i think workouts like that prepared me mentally for Boston because nobody was hitting pace on Boston. Like it wasn't a fast day. It was an, a relatively extremely slow day. Um, but I think it was a different kind of challenge. It was mentally taxing. It was emotionally exhausting. Um, so I think having done workouts where I was not planned that way, but where I was emotionally exhausted, prepared me to be able to exert myself when I was um, in the Boston conditions. This last year has been a, a whirlwind of um, outpouring of support that I could have never anticipated. Um, it's been totally humbling and um, I could not be more grateful for the amount of um, support and uh, love that I received literally from across the globe and um, heading into this upcoming Boston and even races after that, like I, I just feel um, so grateful to be in this position and to um, have running such a key part of my life and such a, an opportunity to interact with um, some pretty amazing people. Yeah, I'm super grateful for the support and can't wait to keep putting in the work and um, hopefully achieve some really cool things.